Okay, so it's a little, uh, this is supposed to be a pedagogical uh, overview of these topics, and uh, there's an interesting range of uh, expertise <coughs> in the audience, ranging from people that know a real lot about this subject. So uh, I'm going to start with some pretty basic stuff, but uh, hopefully uh, include some things that will even uh, be interesting to uh, people who have been working on this topic uh, for some time. And uh, if you want to interrupt with short questions to clarify things, I think that would be good. And if it turns into a long question, I might delay it until uh, the end. Uh, so I wanted to start with just some really general overview uh, slides about glasses. Um, and uh, so I have these two different images of oranges here. Uh, this is the beautiful regular uh, arrangement that's reminiscent of crystals. This is a jumbled mess of oranges in the back of a truck that uh, is reminiscent of the packing in a glass. And I guess I just want to point out that in some sense this material on the left is a lot more interesting than the one on the right because there are so many different local packing arrangements here. Uh, and that provides a lot of opportunity for manipulating uh, the state uh, of the material and also makes glasses better materials for some applications. So I'll just spend two minutes on this because I have sort of a chip on my shoulder about glasses being good materials. Um, so this, the Hubble Space Telescope mirror is a great example of what glasses do well. Uh, so you can see the size of this mirror. It is spectacularly homogeneous, shaped just exactly in the right shape. That really works best with glasses. It doesn't work well uh, with crystals. And so it's an interesting feature of glasses that you can take this local mess, all these different ways of packing, uh, and on a macroscopic scale, you can get this spectacular homogeneity. And so I would say that's one of the key attributes of glasses. Um, Another interesting thing about this mirror is uh, that it's not a pure material. It's 90% SiO2 and 10% TiO2. And that composition was carefully selected to get the smallest thermal expansion coefficient possible. It's something less than 10 to the minus 8. Because this mirror, sometimes it's in space, right? Sometimes it's in the sun, sometimes it's in the shade. Huge temperature swings, but it has to have dimensional stability. And so this illustrates a second key feature of glasses um, is you often have quite a lot of compositional flexibility uh, in glasses, much more than you typically get in crystals. Uh, and uh, so you have a property in mind, you can optimize that property with the composition and over a wide range of composition states, you still get the macroscopic homogeneity. So that is a key feature of glasses. Uh, and then a couple of examples from communications that illustrate some processing advantages uh, of glasses. Uh, optical fibers here, of course the homogeneity of fibers is hugely important, can transmit signals 100 kilometers uh, without, uh, and the signal still gets there. You can't do that if you have uh, crystalline grain boundaries. Um, these fibers actually have a gradient in composition along the radial direction to get the refractive index profile just right. So again, compositional flexibility is important here. And then they can be processed into these fibers which are, you know, have great control over the thickness, over, you know, enormous dimensions. So there's a lot of processing advantages here. Um, also in uh, OLED technologies, most cell phone displays in the world now have uh, OLED screens on them, the, uh, the pixels, uh, individual pixels, uh, the active materials are vapor deposited organic semiconductors, they're glasses. Uh, the film's thicknesses have to be controlled with nanometer precision, they're something like 20, 30 nanometers thick. They have to be molecularly smooth, there can't be pinholes, these are all things that are easy to accomplish with glasses and hard to accomplish uh, with crystals. Okay, so let's talk about uh, different ways of making glasses. So uh, often we make glasses by cooling a liquid. Uh, and so let's start on the left-hand side here. Um, I'm, I'm having a little trouble with this pointer. <laughs> the, it doesn't, it has a, about a one second delay. So you gotta, um, I'm gonna show you some data for this molecule, trisnaphthal benzene. It's just an example of 
uh, a glass forming liquid. The plot on the left shows molar volume versus temperature. And um, the, uh, it's also interesting. It doesn't really seem to go where I point it. All right, we're gonna figure this out eventually. Ah, so in black, you have the true equilibrium states. There's the change in volume characteristic of a first order phase transition. The blue illustrates the supercooled liquid, which really has all the properties you would expect by taking the true liquid and extrapolating to lower temperatures. Um, and then if you continue to cool the liquid, eventually the molecular motions get so slow that say at a cooling rate of one Kelvin per minute, uh, the molecules can't figure out how to get to equilibrium arrangements or their equilibrium volumes and you get stuck in a glass that has the wrong molar volume. And so the upper red line represents a glass made by cooling at one Kelvin per minute and the lower red line is cooling 100 times more slowly than that. So you make a slightly different material because it can stay in equilibrium to a slightly uh, lower temperature. Um, so these things here, are the glasses are shown in red. These are non-equilibrium states. Um, and the, the key really is that this transition is not a phase transition like this one over here. It's just a kinetic phenomenon. When the dynamics of the system get too slow or not patient enough, then the system falls out of equilibrium. So on the right-hand side, I show you a plot of the viscosity of uh, TNV on an inverse temperature plot. And you can't read the scale here but it's really impressive. It starts at 10 to the minus two poise and goes up to 10 to the plus 17 poise, okay? Uh, and so the temperature dependence is really strong. And so this is, uh, it's this strong temperature dependence that makes it so difficult on the left plot to get to lower temperatures and stay in equilibrium. Uh, because you know, for this system, roughly every, uh, if you wanna get down another three Kelvin that means you have to wait 10 times longer. Uh, the next three Kelvin would be 10 times longer than that. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm picking examples from organic systems because those are the ones that I'm familiar with. Uh, but on the left-hand side, I show you uh, the supercooled liquid associated with a metallic glass system. You know, the things that I'm talking about here are really quite general. This is uh, vitriloy one. Uh, what do we have? Something like this is pre pre presented as a flow time, but really it's, it's, you could think about it as the log of a viscosity. Uh, there's 14 orders of magnitude of relaxation times here. Um, there's this interesting break in the middle because this system uh, nucleates and forms crystals in this range and it's hard to get uh, data on the viscosity of or the relaxation time of the supercooled liquid. So the organic systems, uh, can be much better glass formers than that, and so we can get data throughout this, uh, the supercooled liquid range. All right. Um, all right, so another sort of broad point, and this, of course, is something that uh, Paul Evans and Paul Voiles will pick up in their presentation, uh, but another important difference between glasses in crystals is the lack of long-range order. So here, this molecule, TPD, is used in, in OLEDs, uh, the, this is an x-ray scattering pattern. Uh, uh, at the bottom, you have uh, the scattering pattern for uh, just crystals uh, thrown onto a, a substrate. Uh, and on the top, you have the pattern associated with a glass of the same composition. And uh, of course, the glass has no sharp lines. Uh, so the sharp lines are associated with a large coherence length with long range order. So this kind of scattering pattern here with these broad features is characteristic of uh, glassy materials. Okay, so up to this point, you might think that really the glass transition has nothing to do with thermodynamics, it's all about kinetics, but that's not quite true, we don't think, and so I wanna tell you one other way that thermodynamics uh, enters into the glass transition. So say if we look at this molar volume plot here, you might, uh, This is like a video game in which they keep changing the rules. <laughs> uh, if you look at that plot there, the, uh, you might think, well, you keep cooling slower and slower, and if you had enough patience, you would just stay on that. Why not stay on that blue line forever and just keep going there? Uh, uh, so that would be one possibility. 
Uh, but it turns out we think that's not true. We think there's really an end of the line. Uh, there is a densest possible amorphous state for this temperature, and it's a thermodynamic restriction that gives us that impression. Uh, so let me show you that argument. Uh, and it has to do with the entropy, uh, and this is usually called the Kaussmann entropy crisis, but it goes back, uh, the, the data for this goes back uh, to the 1930s, the, the first data uh, from Simons. Here's data for another organic molecule, orthotrophenyl, and um, uh, absolute entropy as a function of temperature. Again, in black, you've got the equilibrium states. In blue, you have the supercooled liquid. Um, and then dash blue is the extrapolation of the supercooled liquid um, entropy. And so um, this part right <laughs> there should alarm you. The part where the extrapolated entropy um, goes negative and would be negative at absolute zero, okay? So uh, for most formulations of the third law, this is a violation uh, of the third law. And probably we really have trouble way, way up here uh, where the, the entropy of the supercooled liquid goes below the entropy of the crystal. Uh, and so, uh, the entropy can be thought of as having two components. It has a configurational part and a vibrational part. If we figure out a way to estimate how big the vibrational part is, then we can concentrate on the configurational entropy. And when that configurational entropy goes to zero, well, it can't go any lower than that. And so that is believed to place a limit on how far we could go down that line. And uh, that thing that you would get if you had the patience to cool infinitely slowly and get to that state um, is called the ideal glass. And um, there is a theoretical con construct called the random first order uh, transition theory, uh, which um, has this sort of, there's lots of aspects to this theory, but has uh, this at its core. And the claim of that theory would be that if you could cool uh, a supercooled liquid infinitely slowly, you would get to this ideal uh, glass state. Uh, but, uh, but we're rescued by kinetics usually if we're trying to get there uh, from the liquid. And then I'll show you, uh, I just wanted to focus on the panel here in the lower right. So you probably can't read this, but this is a plot of configurational entropy versus temperature for about 10 different organic liquids, okay? <clears throat> and if you focus on the steeply declining part and sort of uh, the flat part is when it goes into the glass. But if you didn't go into the glass, if you stayed in equilibrium, you see every one of those systems is headed towards the configurational entropy being zero, well above absolute zero, okay? And so this is the constraint that entropy places on what kind of uh, uh, amorphous systems uh, can be prepared. Mark, can I just ask, why is there a reason to think it's a line extrapolation? Uh, you can, uh, so the, the, what the, the statement is. Mark, maybe repeat the question. Oh, okay. Why should it be a line? Uh, well, okay, so the extrapolation isn't a line. People use something more complex than that. There can be some theoretical basis for it. It can be a quadratic function. I mean, I would say the, it, the essence of the argument doesn't matter. Of course, if you can come up with a theory that says that if I stayed in equilibrium, I would stay on this line, but then it would curve off and it would go off, something like. And of course, the extrapolation has to be wrong. We believe the extrapolation is wrong. So the, the interesting question is not, is the extrapolation wrong? The interesting question is, how do we get rescued from that result? Okay? And a first, uh, some sort of a phase transition that happens when the configurational entry <coughs> gets to zero is just one possibility. And sort of a smooth gradual curve would be another possibility. There could be a phase transition before the configurational entry. I mean, there's many possibilities. Okay, so, but the point is, is that you, in that first plot I showed you, don't, you can't just keep going down that line forever. There is a real limit on the kind of amorphous structures that can be prepared and the configurational entropy is going to have to stay above zero. Okay. So, uh, everything I've set up till now, uh, you can put on this cartoon version of the potential energy landscape. And I'm going to take a couple of minutes 
just to go through this because uh, maybe this is an interesting way for you to think uh, about the problem. Okay, so first of all, the caveat. The real potential energy landscape is a function of the position of, if it's a molecule, every molecule in the system, okay? And so the real potential energy landscape has 10 to the 23rd coordinates, something like that. So this is a cartoon. Everything, we just got one dimension here. Uh, and, um, but I think everything that I'm gonna tell you here um, is solid. So if I have a really high temperature system, I have, oops, I should use this thing. If I have a high temperature system, um, my, I have a high potential energy, and I'm moving around here, my, my system is moving around up here, uh, sort of above the landscape, and the landscape doesn't really put any constraints on how things move, okay? And so that's the region over here where the viscosity or the relaxation time is basically Arrhenius, above Ta, okay? As I cool my system uh, towards Tg at a constant rate, the molecules increasingly are sensing the constraints on packing that the landscape is placing on them. Or if you want to think about a metallic glass, the atoms are feeling uh, those constraints. Um, and that is uh, a big part of the reason why we start getting non arrhenius processes when we're cooling super arrhenius, right? This is stronger than arrhenius temperature dependence. If we're cooling at one Kelvin per minute, uh, we're gonna get stuck on this landscape at some point, uh, maybe where that dotted line shown by TG is. Uh, if we're willing to age our system, like for a month just below TG, we give it more time to equilibrate, we can move sort of lower on the landscape, uh, there are some other methods for getting even lower on the landscape that we may mention later on. But in terms of our previous conversation, the real point is, is that if this ideal glass scenario is correct, if the configurational entropy goes down to zero and then there's a big kink in it, what that's really saying is that there is a bottom of the landscape for the amorphous systems. That is, there is a lowest energy glass, uh, and that is the ideal glass. Now, as Dane mentioned, there are other possible resolutions, and if there's some smooth curve, then you have to draw the bottom part of this differently than it's drawn here, okay? And so, um, there's some interesting stuff that we don't know about the bottom of this landscape, uh, which is tied into theoretical pictures uh, for what happens um, in supercooled liquids. Okay, let me move on. Um, so again, I started off saying it's all kinetics, and now I've told you one reason to think that thermodynamics really has a lot to do with, uh, with what we observe when we cool a liquid and it forms a glass, and we're gonna give you one more reason to think that. And we'll just look at the plot on the left here um, so what's plotted in here is Tk, that's the Kaussmann temperature, that's the temperature where the configurational entropy by some simple extrapolation goes to zero. Okay, so that is a measure of the thermodynamics of our system. What's plotted on the bottom axis is T0, which is taking dynamics in the data, fitting it to a certain functional form called the vogel tamman fulcher form and extrapolating to a point where it seems like the dynamics diverge, where they become infinitely slowly. And the interesting thing about this plot is that this purely thermodynamic thing and this purely dynamic thing show a pretty strong correlation for lots of different systems. And so this is another reason to think that there are some strong connections between thermodynamics and the glass transition, even though the glass transition that we normally measure upon cooling a liquid is a kinetic artifact. It's because we just didn't give the system enough time uh, to equilibrate. Okay, so I think this is really interesting. I hope that I can explain it clearly enough. Uh, so I remember when I first started learning about glasses like 30 years ago, 
I thought to myself, well, what, what would be the structure of an ideal glass? And I could never come up with anything that made sense because it always seemed to get really ordered like a crystal because it didn't have entropy, but then why is it a glass? So this is one of the things that simulations have really sorted out in the last 10 years or so. Uh, I think we now understand if there's an ideal glass, we know what it's going to look like. Uh, and to a first approximation, it's going to look like every other glass. Okay, but let me explain um, how this works. So uh, imagine that you have uh, a computer simulation of some liquid. Uh, so here we have uh, spheres of different sizes, and we, <coughs> we equilibrate this system a long time at some temperature, so we have an equilibrium configuration. Now, uh, take that box that you have and freeze the particles, positions of the particles, outside of some spherical cavity. Okay, so everything that's in gray there on the outside, the positions are frozen. And now rerun the simulation, just allowing the particles on the inside to move and equilibrate the system again. Uh, and the question is, for the particles right here in the center, how likely are we to recreate the same configuration that we started with? And the observation of the simulations is that if you choose uh, a small enough sphere, maybe one that's only four particle diameters across, you come back to the same configuration basically every time. Okay, that is, uh, and if you pick a really big sphere, okay, you don't come back to the same configuration every time. So for every temperature where you do this, you can find the size sphere, which is just the critical size, which just is just the right size to specify sort of what all the packing inside this sphere is going to be like. And as you equilibrate your system at lower and lower temperatures, the size sphere you have to pick is getting bigger and bigger. And for the best simulations at the lowest temperature, I think it's eight particle diameters across. So there's something like 150, 200 particles in this sphere. And you might think, uh, you know, how is this amorphous boundary condition here? How is it possibly able to communicate all this information and recreate the packing of, of those particles. Okay, well that's the loss of configurational entropy. The system is running out of ways to be packed, okay, and uh, you can measure that in this uh, simulation. And so what an ideal glass would be then would be the size of that sphere getting really big, but nevertheless there's still enough information on the surface of that sphere to specify what the particle packing is um, all the way um, in the middle of the sphere. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I was just going to show you one result about physical vapor deposition, which is a technique that uh, IRG1 uh, uses, my own lab uh, uses. This is not actually our work. This is uh, work from a Japanese group. Uh, so let me get you oriented here. This is enthalpy versus temperature, okay? So I've shown you several plots of molar volume versus temperature. If you plot enthalpy versus temperature, they look basically the same. You go down a line and there's kink up at the glass transition. And this kink right here is the kink associated with the glass transition. And the supercooled liquid is going up like this, okay? And this just shows that one of the cool things about vapor deposition is that you can apparently equilibrate the system down to much lower temperatures than you can from liquid cooling. Um, and in this case, you move about two thirds of the way down to the Kalsman temperature. And I would interpret this result to indicate that this extrapolation, Dane was worried, why should it be a simple, why should it be a line? Why should it be any simple function? Uh, well, it looks pretty simple, at least for closing two-thirds of that gap. And so I would say exper this experiment and other experiments like it uh, are suggestive. They don't prove it, but they're suggestive uh, that, this, uh, that something pretty dramatic has to happen if you stay in equilibrium down to within just a few Kelvin of this Kalsman temperature. Again, supporting the idea that, there, that there's some underlying thermodynamics uh, beneath the kinetically controlled glass transition that we deal with um, in the laboratory. Okay, so I'm switching now. That was about thermodynamics. 
of, of glasses. And now I want to talk about uh, dynamics and relaxation processes um, in glasses. And um, I'm sure this list isn't comprehensive, but I, I tried to make a list. I, I, I phrased this in this way because I remember when I was a graduate student, I started working on glasses just completely as a random side project. And I was really surprised how much, how much molecular motion there was, even on, in the glassy state. I thought, well, surely there's nothing moving in a glass. Okay, well, I, so I had the, the, the wrong idea. There's lots of stuff moving in glasses. Um, and uh, this is sort of a list of different things that glasses can do, even though they're a glass. Um, so one of the things they can do is they can crystallize, even though they're a glass, okay? Something's gonna have to move around to form a nucleus or to grow uh, into a larger crystal. Uh, so in this case, we're making a transition from the non-equilibrium glass state, usually to a stable, uh, the stable uh, crystal state. And uh, so these images aren't super clear, but these are just some uh, examples of old glasses that uh, uh, give me an opportunity to, to talk about how stable glasses might be or might not be against crystallization. So this is a Roman vase uh, that's 2,500 years old and uh, it's still pretty amorphous. You can still see through it. It's transparent. Um, this is obsidian. Okay, you can see the bug Oh, amber, it's amber. We get to obsidian. This, you can see the bug in the amber. This sample is about 20 million years old and is still amorphous. Um, this is obsidian, this arrowhead here. I don't know how old this obsidian sample was, but there are uh, obsidian, obsidian means the glass. There are obsidian samples on Earth as old as 75 million years old, okay? So, uh, that's an indication of how long this crystallization process uh, can take. And, uh, and these are little beads of uh, silicate-based glass from the moon, um, which are 3.5 billion years old, okay, and completely amorphous, okay? And so um, it can last a really long time, even though they're non-equilibrium. The transition to equilibrium can take a long time. It can be much faster than that, okay? And so uh, maybe this is something that some of the later uh, talks will come into, but for organic systems, uh, there's a really wide range. We have systems that we work with in our lab which we've never seen crystallize from the glassy state. And we have other, other systems which even at 10%, 15% below TG would be noticeably crystalline in a few days. Okay, and the crystals are growing even though you're 10 or 15 percent below TG. So I think there's a lot of variability, but this is certainly one of the things that can happen uh, to a glass um, is it can turn into the, the stable state. Okay, so second thing. Another thing that can happen is something called physical aging, okay, uh, which is Again, the thermodynamic state of a glass changing, but it's the glass moving towards the supercooled liquid, not moving towards the crystal. Okay. And so let me show you some data about that. Um, this is uh, a paper that John Parapesco and I and J.Q. Wong published a few years ago on this five component gold-based metallic glass using the flash DSC technique. Um, and uh, so the way this, this experiment works is you start off with the system at equilibrium above the melting point, okay? You do a very rapid quench to some temperature below the glass transition temperature. You hold it for some period of time and then the rest of this whole experiment is just measuring what the enthalpy was as a result of that aging profile. And so this panel B here shows you how the enthalpy of the system evolves in time. So I, I want to make sure you understand this is a logarithmic time scale here. It covers eight decades. This is one of the nice things that you can do with this flash DSC apparatus. So we have aging times from 10 milliseconds up to something like a week. 
Okay, so let's just look at the black curve to start with. Okay, so this was a system that was held uh, 30 degrees below TG. And as it's held for a millisecond, up to a second, up to 10 seconds, the longer you hold it, the more the enthalpy drops, and then the enthalpy plateaus, okay? And that's because at this point, it's reached the enthalpy of the supercooled liquid. So if you want to look at that visually, think about this plot down here, and erase molar volume and write enthalpy, okay? And then what we're watching is the process of going down in enthalpy from one of the glass lines to the supercooled liquid line. We get to the supercooled liquid and we stay there unless the system figures out how to nucleate crystals. Okay? So this is, in my language, the process of a glass aging into a supercooled liquid because now it's in a metastable equilibrium state. And if we had chosen the blue curve, that means we would be, say, 40, 50 degrees below TG, okay, then it would take longer for the same, but basically the same thing would qualitatively happen. Now it would take 100 seconds in order for the enthalpy to plateau off, which means the system has stopped aging. This is, this is physical aging. This process of the system evolving towards the metastable um, equilibrium state. Uh, and then you see if we go um, 100 degrees below TG, which is the green curve, we only get to see the first part of the experiment. We get to see the enthalpy going down, down, and down, but we don't have enough time to wait for the system to equilibrate because we're so far below TG. It would probably take, I don't know, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12 seconds for that to happen. Okay, so this is the process of, of physical aging seen from the perspective of a thermodynamic variable. Um, and of course, as we go through this stage, um, we are making, diff in my language, we're making different glasses. We're taking one glass and turning it into another glass, a glass that has, say, a higher density, has a lower enthalpy, is packed better, okay? And as you have a better packed glass, the properties change. One of the properties that change is that when you take that glass and you heat it up, you have to heat it to higher temperature before it figures out how to become a liquid because now all the barriers for rearrangements have gotten bigger. So that's shown here in this panel. This is a plot, uh, this is a plot of heat flow versus temperature. And as you go in the direction of the arrow, this is, an, iso this is a, an experiment where the same sample is held at the same temperature, but for increasing periods of time from 100 seconds to 100,000 seconds. And where this, this big peak occurs, that is where the system is, is uh, sucking in heat in the process to get into the liquid state. And you can see that that peak is just moving up by tens, twenties, thirties of degrees um, as a result of this aging process where we're pushing the system down lower in the landscape. Is there something counterintuitive about the fact that it is aging to become a liquid? Uh, only... It's uh, harder to... There's, there's nothing counterintuitive to me. Uh, if you start off with the idea that glasses are always slower than liquids, then it's counterintuitive. But I, for me, glass is a statement about the thermodynamic state. That's non-equilibrium. Supercooled liquid is metastable equilibrium. And so the non-equilibrium state is aging into the metastable state. The non-equilibrium states are called glasses. The metastable state is called the supercooled liquid. Not everybody uses this language, but this is what makes sense to me. But why does it take more heat flow to form the supercooled liquid ah. if you age into the supercooled liquid? Okay, so uh, uh, this is, I'm really going to be challenged by the resolution here, but okay, so imagine this says enthalpy here. Imagine that I've aged to the end of that arrow. Okay, now it took me, say, a, three days to age to the end of the arrow. The system is really stiff, I mean, it's really sluggish at this point. Now, in this experiment, I'm heating at ah, 10,000 Kelvin per second, you know, okay? And so when I heat, I don't heat up that blue line. I heat up a line which is parallel to those red lines, okay? And then, uh, because my system is well packed, I have to go to quite a high temperature before it, it starts to escape its packing. And at the point where it does that, there's a big gap between where I am and that blue line. And that gap is the heat 
that has to flow into the system, which is being shown here by these curves. So no, I would say there's nothing counterintuitive about this. <coughs> okay, so let me go back here. Um, all right, so we're just going down this list. So we talked about um, one thing that can happen is the non-equilibrium state can fall into a stable state. That's the process of crystallization. Uh, the non-equilibrium state can very, very slowly evolve into a metastable state. That's physical aging of the glass. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's go down, let's, you know, let's work somewhere between half TG and, and TG, but let's not wait long enough for the state of the system really to change. Okay, but there's still stuff going on in our glass. There are atomic motions, molecular motions that are happening. And so these are called sub-TG relaxations, or sometimes they're called beta relaxations. And so let me tell you about that, because that's an important aspect of dynamics in glasses. All right, so let me go forward here now. Whoops, okay. Uh, so I showed you that potential energy landscape earlier. And you should imagine that all those minima that I showed you were things that looked like this. But maybe, still interest suggests, and computer simulations agree with this, that in fact it might have happened in the other order. Um, if you go into any of those dips and you look carefully, you find many, many smaller dips superimposed on that. And so at, at a really qualitative level, we can think about the, the process of aging um, or the process of uh, molecules in a liquid finding themselves a new set of nearest neighbors, those kinds of relaxations carry us from one of these things to the other thing. And these things are called metabasins. Okay, so when you go from one metabasin to another, that is uh, a complete relaxation of your local environment. Um, sometimes called the alpha relaxation process. But even when I'm stuck with one set of neighbors, which means I can't figure out how to escape this one metabasin, there are still little transitions that I can make from between one potential energy minimum and the other. And remember, this, this ill-defined x-coordinate here is something about how the atoms and molecules are positioned. So these are molecular rearrangements of some type that are occurring uh, that allow uh, uh, the, the, the details of the positions of the atoms uh, to change. Okay, so let me just show you a couple of experiments that, uh, that illustrate that. So uh, on the left here uh, is a dielectric relaxation experiment for toluene. So toluene has a small dipole moment that goes along the long axis uh, of the molecule. And if you put toluene in a very, very small alternating electric field and change the frequency over a really wide range, you can figure out where those dipoles um, are able to reorient. So this is a plot of the loss spectra. And let's see, let's look at this, this curve right here. Okay, that big peak right there that occurs at a log frequency of zero, that represents this alpha process. That's going from, from one of these metabasins to another. But then if we go to higher frequencies, like 10 to the 4 hertz, there's another peak. And qualitatively, when we interpret that as the transitions between these smaller basins in the material. And you can see, as I change the temperature, which is what these different curves are here, you know, I can take this, this big peak and I can move it completely off the left side. That happens when I'm in the glass. But there's still a peak up here at like 10 to the fourth hertz, which means that even when I have a glass, there's stuff rattling around on a relatively high uh, frequency scale. And I'm showing you this for organic materials. As far as I know, this is true for every glass. Okay? There's stuff rattling around. Now, in the case of toluene, we happen to know a lot about what rattling around means. Uh, it means that the long axis of the molecule is moving around maybe in a cone of something like seven degrees or 10 degrees or something like that. And so it's not a complete rearrangement of the local environment. It's just a, a cooperative rearrangement of, of one molecule with a group of molecules around it that allows some 
subtle reorientation. And uh, maybe we'll just skip the plot in the lower right, which just shows you um, how these things play out uh, as a function of temperature. Okay, so I picked an example from a metallic glass also to illustrate um, the beta relaxation process. So this is a lanthanum-based uh, four-component metallic glass shown here. And so the experiment, <clears throat> so you got, imagine you have a, uh, a bar of this stuff and you grab a hold of the two ends with some sort of mechanical apparatus and you impose a, a low amplitude one hertz uh, stretching and compressing motion on the material, okay? And then you measure, uh, so you measure how stiff it is. So you're measuring the Young's modulus of the material at one hertz, because it's a dynamic experiment, and there's an in-phase component and an out-of-phase component. Okay, so the green curve here is the in-phase component. This is normally what we think about as the Young's modulus of the material. So TG for this system is up here at 450, so if we measure it at 250 Kelvin, okay, we have a pretty respectable Young's modulus, uh, almost 30 gigapascals. And if you keep measuring at one hertz, you see there's this interesting little drop that occurs down to about 350 and then it's flat again, and then the glass melts into a liquid, okay? So this is the in-phase component. The out-of-phase component of the lost part has the two peaks that we saw with toluene in the previous uh, data set. And so this is the main process, the alpha process, by which these atoms find new sets of neighbors with each other. Uh, so that's what TG is here at about 450 Kelvin. But down here at 320 Kelvin, there's another peak in this function, which means that there's some sort of interesting rearrangements that the atoms are choosing to do at a frequency of one hertz, okay? Um, well below the glass transition temperature. So this is an example of, of a, a sub-TG uh, relaxation process. Things are still twitching around even though we've got a glass. Um, I picked this example because uh, for this system, there's pretty good evidence that the mechanical properties of the system are tied into this beta process. So uh, they did many experiments. Uh, so, so I should, actually there was another important I want to emphasize that this deformation we're doing at one hertz is a teeny, teeny deformation. So this is a linear response experiment. We're not forcing the system to make these motions, okay? These are systems that, these are motions that exist in this system uh, spontaneously. Um, and so you take, uh, so then they do another set of experiments where they really pull on it and either uh, it breaks right away or it manages to deform significantly before it breaks. So the first one is called brittle failure, the second one's called ductile failure, and uh, so they plot out as a function of temperature and strain rate where that failure occurs, and then you can put the beta relaxation and that brittle ductile failure data all on one Arrhenius curve, which, which uh, sort of links together these motions as being important in determining how the material is going to fail when you pull on it. These teeny tiny little twitches that are happening um, in the glass. Okay, so let me go back then to my list. Mark, yes. I, what is happening in the ductile part? The brittle part I understand is the glass can't, it doesn't have defects and then the, it shatters because the stress yeah. gets too high yeah. and yeah. It, it doesn't support the, the right So the, kind of I think the, the qualitative picture would be um, that if you're close enough to TG, these, the beta relaxation processes are sort of the precursor to something that gets accelerated by the stress on the sample and allows transitions to occur. So it'll flow. So it can flow rather than break. Right. That would be the qualitative picture. Yes. Okay, so we go back to our list here of, of all the different ways in which glasses are not dead. Uh, and we're working our way down from just below TG to maybe half of TG. And now I want to go way down into the quantum regime. Uh, so 10 Kelvin and below and talk a little bit about relaxation processes in glasses. 
Um, and I should mention that Francis Hellman, who's part of our IRG, is really the expert um, on this, but I'm including this just to provide a little bit uh, of overview. So uh, these, there's strong evidence that the relaxations we see at these very low temperatures are, are associated with quantum mechanical tunneling through barriers. Okay, so that's an interesting feature. It's quantum mechanical. Um, you can think about that as very small rearrangements occurring in the material, while the overall structure of the glass is really very tightly fixed uh, at, at these low temperatures. And there's an interesting practical reason to be concerned about this is that, um, uh, so for example, the scheme that IBM is using for quantum computing involves holding a qubit at 10 millikelvin, uh, but the qubit somehow has to be attached to the rest of the universe and it's attached through glass. Okay, and it turns out that little twitches in the glass that occur even at 10 millikelvin are a source, are in fact a dominant source of noise for this qubit uh, and lead to decoherence, uh, which means the coherence time is uh, a microsecond instead of the second or something that they want. Um, well, it leads to it being a microsecond. Whether by removing this you could get to a second is a different question. Okay, but so this is one of the reasons why there's been a renewed interest in, uh, in quantum uh, tunneling two-level systems. Okay, so let me just show you a little bit about these very low temperature dynamics uh, that can occur in glasses. And first of all, it, how, how this came to be, you won't, sorry, you probably can't read these plots, but I'll have to, but I'll present them. Um, so uh, about 1972, uh, some people started doing low temperature physics experiments on glasses and they were surprised that the properties were completely different than crystals and that it seemed to a first approximation that all glasses had the same properties. Okay, And so let me just illustrate that with, um, with a little bit of data here. So this is a plot of the log of the constant pressure heat capacity, it covers three decades. This is log temperature um, and the upper end of the temperature scale is one Kelvin, okay? And it covers uh, two decades, okay? And so um, what's plotted here is the heat capacity expected for a crystal of SiO2, okay? So it actually can be measured somewhere up here, okay? And it's too small to be measured down here, but it's faithfully following the Debye T cubed law that we expect okay, for a crystalline material. And so this is, uh, so for other time, for other systems, it's actually been measured partly down here. Anyway, so the crystals way down here follows T cubed. The glasses are way up here and something more like T to the first power. Okay, and so if you're sitting at two tenths of a Kelvin, this is more than one, a factor of 10 in heat capacity difference between these, between the amorphous form and the crystalline form. Uh, on the middle panel here, you have a plot of thermal conductivity versus temperature. And so, uh, let's see, what do we have? I guess, eight orders of magnitude in thermal conductivity on the left axis, three orders of magnitude in temperature from a tenth of a Kelvin up to 100 Kelvin. Uh, this is the thermal co conductivity of the, of the uh, SiO2 crystal, okay? Follows T cubed. And the glass is somewhere down here, much lower, like four orders of magnitude lower, okay? So uh, these observations were made on many glasses and the, the, like this T to the first power, T to the 1.2 power um, is apparently at that time was thought to be universal for all glasses, okay? Um, and so there was a, a, a big effort to come up with a very general theoretical construct that could explain this, and this is where the quantum tunneling two-level systems came from, and the idea is that there's uh, some sort of an asymmetric potential, uh, and uh, if you have the right distribution of barriers and the right kind of properties for these potentials, then you can reproduce the generic features uh, that are seen here. Uh, okay, I need to just check, the, I can't see it, ah, oh, I should stop because it's five till 12. Um, so this was actually, this is what I was gonna say. 
Maybe I'll just take two more minutes and just to say, again, one of the interesting things about vapor-deposited glasses, this is back to secondary relaxations. Um, this is a liquid cool glass. This is beta and alpha. Oops, people remotely can't see this. This is a liquid cool glass. This is beta and alpha. And this is a vapor deposited glass. This is beta and alpha. And so there's this suppression of a factor of three and a half of these sub TG rattling around by vapor depositing the glass. It's, it's a denser glass. It's really well packed. So that's sort of one of the interesting things about vapor deposition is that it can reach glassy states that we really can't figure out how to reach in other ways. And then uh, this heat capacity at low temperature, uh, Francis has done some very nice work on this. Maybe I'll just start with this example here, which was not Francis's work, which just showed that a vapor deposited organic glass, this is a plot of CP over T cubed. Okay, there's the crystal shown in green. This is a liquid cool glass going up, 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 up. And these are vapor deposited glasses that are flat. So another interesting thing about the vapor deposited glasses is that um, they have at least 10 times fewer of uh, these two level systems that were thought to be universal. And Francis's group has produced uh, silicon, amorphous silicon, and shown that by changing the substrate temperature in a deposition process, they can modulate the, uh, the, the, the number of two level systems in the, uh, in the by, I think it's at least a factor of 50. Okay. And so, um, again, this connects into some of the technological interest in developing glasses that have very uh, little relaxation at low temperatures to be able to make different kinds of glasses that would be optimized in that way. Okay, uh, so I'll just stop. Uh, be happy to try and answer questions. Uh, in the unlikely event that you want more information about glasses, I'm going to point out that there is four weeks of great stuff at this summer school from two years ago that was in Boulder. And all of the lectures are available online. You can watch them. Uh, in fact, you can get four and a half hours of me giving background information um, on glasses. And a little uh, trick is that uh, there's a little dial on there. You can turn me up to 1.5 times normal <coughs> speed, and it's perfectly understandable. So, <laughs> OK, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Stair kindering, and I remember the arguments about glass transition tempers and things. But for the metallic glasses and these little twitches, can you physically give me an idea of what you think one of these little twitches is doing to two kind of metallically bonded elements that are maybe slightly moving their relative positions? Do I think of two atoms actually exchanging places, or is it just they? rotated a little bit. How do I think about that? I would don't, not, don't forget to repeat it for the... Oh, yes. Okay. So how do we think about the motions responsible in, for the beta relaxation process in metallic glass? Well, the first thing I would say is this is another exciting thing that's happened in the last decade is computer simulations have gotten fast enough and good enough that, that you, can, you can start to really explore this from the standpoint of simulations. And so... Uh, I read some papers recently. I don't remember exactly what the answer is. So first of all, I'll just say that the work is out there. Uh, this is what I remember. I, rem I remember, so you're not uh, in, a, in a beta process, uh, a given atom, let's suppose it had 10 nearest neighbors. You know, at most, uh, you know, after the relaxation process, you know, at, when you're all done, nine or 10 of those neighbors are gonna be the same, okay? And if one of them's different, there's a pretty good chance you wait a while, they're going to go back to the way they were. Okay? And so, so it's, it's not like you've, there's any loss of memory of the cage, of the initial cage. So when you really lose memory of how you were packed, that's, a, that's the alpha process. That's the main glass transition process. So the other thing that there have been a lot of stuff about in recent simulation papers is string-like motion. Whether you know one little, maybe this guy goes a third of a diameter, and this guy goes a third of a diameter, and this guy goes a third, and, and so maybe you have four or five of these things, 
And maybe the beta process sort of looks like this string sort of going back and forth. Maybe. Um, so, I would say to a first approximation, everything that I've said applies to polymer glasses. Um, I, I, okay, I can't vapor deposit them as easily, so maybe that part doesn't apply. But they have, you know, they age, they have secondary relaxation, they have these tunneling two level systems, they, um, uh, the kinetics of aging are broadly similar between polymeric glasses and other uh, low molecular weight organic compounds. Uh, so there are some, po I guess one thing that's different is that for every system that, I've sh that I showed today, I'm pretty sure you can find the crystal. Okay? There are some polymers which are, um, their stereochemistry is random along the backbone. And because of that, as far as we know, they never crystallize. And so that, that would be one qualitative uh, difference that would show up for some polymer systems. More questions for Mark. Um, you mentioned the uh, advantages of the vapid and positive glasses being that you can get them kind of denser and more, more tightly packed. Uh, how does that? translated to useful properties for the glasses? Like what, what's better about having these denser glasses? Uh, so the question is, uh, what useful properties would vapor deposited glasses have, or maybe better properties than a liquid cool glass? Um, so the OLED example is, is, is one that we've thought about. Uh, so vapor deposition for many systems will produce glasses that are 1% you know, more dense than a liquid cool glass. But that 1% that can buy you, uh, in an isothermal experiment, a factor of 10 to the 5 in kinetic stability. So the, the glass packing can be, will hang around 100,000 times longer than the, the liquid cool glass. Um, less susceptible to chemical reactions in the glass. The tighter packing actually uh, impedes chemical reactivity. Um, so that can be an order of magnitude um, or larger effect. And then an interesting one, this was not our work, another group, uh, they made an OLED and they, they made the same device over and over again. The only variation was they changed the temperature at which they deposited one layer and they found that the OLED was brightest when they uh, optimize the density of that layer. These layers were made by vapor deposition. And then they tracked down the reason. Uh, so in OLEDs, there's an organic molecule. And there's an electron in a hole that recombine on the molecule. The molecule emits light, um, either fluorescence or, or phosphorescence. And they found out that if you pack a glass densely around this emitter molecule, the quantum yield of the molecule goes up. Because you cut off radiationless relaxation pathways. So it's, it's, it's similar to eliminating these secondary relaxation processes. You're, you're, uh, you're limiting the, the, the kinds of motions that occur in the glass. And uh, for that particular application, having a glass without motion is better. Okay. Maybe time for one last question. Um, so thinking about this, those, this, those uh, vapor deposited glasses. So um, normally, if you were to to quench a glass very quickly, you would think of yourself as being further away from the ideal glass. So yes. What is the, how do you get closer to the ideal glass is it with the vapor deposition? Um, oh, that's, okay, so the question is, um, I'll paraphrase. In vapor deposition, molecules hit a surface and presumably they cool off very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So that seems like a fast quench, which seems like would give you a low density glass because that what that plot would imply. But why do we get the opposite? Uh, well, okay, so you have, this is why vapor deposition, why something new has happened in vapor deposition in the last 10 years, because everybody assumed that what you said was true, <laughs> but it turns out there's something else going on, and that is that glasses have mobile surfaces. And so 
if you're holding your substrate at say 85% of TG, uh, what you said is true, you very quickly quench uh, from whatever temperature the molecule had to the substrate temperature, but there's enough mobility at the surface, like maybe a million times more than you expected uh, in the bulk, and, though, and so that mobility allows, while these molecules live for 10 or 20 seconds before they get buried by other molecules, they're swimming around and sampling, and that's the key. <laughs>